Once again, thank you for joining me on our Side by Side. And I'm hoping to take us on the journey through Romans chapter 8 this week. Now, what a chapter, what a challenge. And then it's coinciding with the, perhaps the busiest week I've had this year for deadlines, about four deadlines to reach this week and to record three different types of messages and so forth. So it's quite a challenge, but I will do my best to at least open a couple of little windows. That's all I can do. You may be aware that someone like uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preached uh, dozens of sermons on this one chapter. And that gives you an idea of the wit and the amount of material that can be produced from it. In a little book by W.H. Griffith Thomas, he quotes about this chapter, If Holy Scripture was a ring, and the epistle to the Romans a precious stone, then chapter 8 would be the sparkling point of the jewel. It doesn't have to give us a challenge, for we don't want to miss that, do we? But... Chapter 7, someone once said, well, why did Paul write chapter 8? Well, it's because he wrote chapter 7, which has a kind of a gloom and anxiety about it, where we're left with that battle and that struggle. And what uh, Jim Packer says about this, he says, as he sees the need now to remind individually and those at once that what is decisive is not what the law says about them, but what the gospel says. Christian assurance develops as forcibly as he can in this. No condemnation at the start and no separation at the end. And so it's a bit of, to quote Packer again, this chapter 8 is like an antidote to the wretchedness that comes from being measured by the law. It's, I suppose you could say, Romans 8 gets Christians out of Romans 7. And that's what we need. There are four little gifts that Paul makes here that points to the first is no condemnation or being made right in the sight of God and the second is the Holy Spirit which takes a large section in the middle the third is to be adopted as a child into the Lord's family and the fourth is security that sense of complete security so these are four things we'll have a look at them each day and then some other summing up on the Friday God willing Now, it's an interesting thought, this thought of no condemnation. And it's an amazing thought when you think about it, that we can really know today, not having to wait until some time in the future, that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's a legal term, and it's really declaring us that we are not guilty. We are not guilty. Romans has painted a picture for us where it clearly states that everyone is guilty, all have fallen short of the glory of God, and all stand clearly under the judgment of God. There's no question about that. Our bad deeds and our good deeds full of badness are also bringing us into the place where we really have nothing to offer God. We stand totally, totally uh, guilty. But in order to try and help us understand why this is possible. And we are told here it is for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is really important to try and figure out what does that mean? It's one of Paul's most favourite types of ways of describing his relationship, that he's in Christ. That's the word. And maybe turning to the Old Testament might be a place to give us some ideas as to what that might be like. Take the example of Noah. Now, when the ark was finished, and it was in doing so the ark was for Noah and his family, it was a perfect means of escaping the divine justice that was just about to be proclaimed and executed upon the world. God had judged the world, it was evil, and he was going to uh, wipe it clean, as it were. And so he makes, he builds the ark, takes 120 years, Then the animals are drawn to the ark, two by two, and then he himself is to go into the ark. Now it's interesting that the word for the ark being covered with pitch, that is in Genesis, it tells us that it was pitched within and without with pitch. That word pitch is an identical word that is used elsewhere for atonement. 
And what we really see, Noah is in a place of atonement. It's a place where God is going to rescue him. The flood will bring peace again, God's judgment upon the society and the world. And so when Noah goes into the ark, he is there in the finished place. This is a finished place, this ark taken so long, but he's in there where he is secure. And it tells us that he doesn't close himself in. It says that God shut the door. (laughs) And so this is a God's doing thing. And what it means here is for Noah, it means, what it means for Noah is the same as for us to be in Christ. We are in a place where we are safe and where there is no more condemnation in Jesus Christ, in relationship to Christ. Christ comes to indwell our hearts. We'll see this in Romans 8 by his Holy Spirit. And it's by Christ indwelling our hearts by the Holy Spirit that we are able now to do the will of God that which is good and pleasing and perfect that he tells us in Romans 12, that which is summed up in the law of God, and we know ourselves to be good. We, we admire it, we strive for it, but we fail. But we know that in Christ we are safe and secure. Now, that's a great thing to be able to rest in, isn't it? I think it's really important that in that place we can therefore know that we're not no longer as it were, controlled by sin. And I think there's a helpful little illustration of the second verse here. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Someone has used the illustration of a coin being dropped from the hand. It falls, and it falls according to a law, the law of gravity. It's pulling it down. But if someone were to put their hand underneath that coin and catch it, Another can lift it and prevent it from continuing on that downward fall. Now, it's not entirely a perfect illustration because, you know, the co- the, the, the coin will fall, uh, as it were, and it kind of just, it falls. Whereas you and I, we sin by our own, that inner propulsion we have. But nonetheless, something has happened to give us this power that we no longer have to continue in that direction. And and this is so important that we know that there is no condemnation now because we are in Christ. This is talking about assurance. And it's not talking about feeling assurance. Sometimes people think they're sure because they feel assured. You know, you can feel assured without being able to be assured. I was watching a, a little film called Farewell about a Chinese family and a Chinese lady who they all said had this cancer and so nobody would talk to her about it. So they thought the fact that they could keep the truth from her would mean that she would be much happier. Yes, and it's true she was much happier, but she wasn't any healthier. Feeling that she was okay did not make her okay. It's only that she actually would be okay that she would be okay, if you know what I mean. And so even though we may feel assured, and sometimes people have a false sense of assurance because that's what religion does for people. It gives them this temporary false sense of assurance. You know, if I work hard and I do good things, I feel good for a little while. But then gradually, as I don't be able to do the good things, I start to feel shaky in my assurance until I do more good things. And so and so it goes on. But that's not what the Bible is teaching. And that's not what Romans is teaching. Romans is telling us, And Paul, writing to the Jewish, mostly Jewish Christian church, which I think is that Jewish emphasis within it, he's saying, getting this across to them. Although we know we fail, and although we know we feel condemned, we are not condemned when we are in Jesus Christ. The gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done, is really what creates in our hearts that sense of assurance. Even though we don't feel it, And there are many times in your life and my life we will not feel it, especially when we maybe do something, think something, say something, and say, well, I'm useless. Look look at I. We're able to say like Paul, oh, wretched man that I am, oh, wretched woman that I am. But then we're able to say, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ we are to be forgiven. He was judged for us. His perfect life has been given to us. God looks at you and I through his work and he's able to say to you, this is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. Now go out into this day knowing that truth and even though you don't feel assured, know 
that God gives you this assurance because of Jesus and you're trusting completely in him.